Good to be here this morning in the house of the Lord. Good to have his spirit. Good to have his word. Amen. Amen. I'd like to turn your attention this morning as we uh, have prepared our hearts for the preaching of God's word through the singing. Hopefully at this time you're well prepared. We're going to turn to the book of James, chapter number one. Book of James, chapter number one, we're going to read just a few verses. It actually escaped my attention until late last week that it was Father's Day coming up. I think it was Wednesday night, we were headed home from church, and my wife started rehearsing to me what was supposed to happen this Sunday. And she mentioned Father's Day, and I just, Father's Day, totally snuck up on me this year. But uh, nonetheless, I thought we might this morning just turn our attention for a little while to the Father. The Father. God the Father and His uh, work in man. And there's a title in the book of James in the first chapter that He's given that we don't spend a lot of time talking about, and it's not a title that we um, use extensively of God the Father, but I thought we might use it as kind of a jumping off place this morning. So if you feel so led with me this morning, you can stand with me as we read, beginning in verse number 16. We're just going to read through verse number 18. Do not err, my beloved brethren, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Heavenly Father, Lord, this morning we come to you and just make our supplication unto you this morning through the Spirit, that you might hear us this morning as we ask for you to Open our hearts and our minds to the things of your word that have been preserved for us, Lord, that we might read of the words of life, that we might know of your work, that we might know of your son, that we might know of your will towards us, Lord. We pray that you might just be with the time spent this morning in your word, be with the preaching, that you would just give me uh, clarity of mind to speak the truth, give the people an open heart, Lord, that you might uh, prepare their hearts to hear and to receive and that they might receive it as it is in truth, the Word of God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I struggled a little bit exactly how to uh, begin, and I've tried to prepare this in such a way that it would be most easily received, but this name, Father of Lights, uh, really just kind of, grabbed my attention in a way that I wanted to spend some time thinking about that and reflecting on that this morning, because there are here in just these few verses um, a lot that encompasses a lot of aspects about the work of God as it is in man. So when we think of God, and the Bible makes this comparison often and all through Scripture of making God and representing Him to us as light, The Bible says in many places about the fact that God is light uh, and that in him is no darkness at all. So the fact that God is light and that he is here called the father of lights invokes, I think, several different aspects of uh, what we know from the word of God involving his creative work on the earth, which isn't complete. He's still creating to this day. He's still working out the things and the purposes that he has established. But this idea, and it's in verse, 1 John 1, 5, this then is the message we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So as we look at this creative work of God and we talk about the father of lights, I'll just jump right to the, the end of where we're going then. If he's the father of lights and he is light, and he has sent his light into the world in the person of Christ, then when we receive that light by faith and the indwelling of the Spirit of God in us, creating that new creature, we then being given the power to be the sons of God are called the children of light, and thus the father of lights is a very fitting title for the God that we serve, 
for those of us who are his children. And he has created in us his light to shine in this world now. So the whole point of what we're talking about, when we say father of lights, if you're one of his children, then we are those lights sent into the world, having been given the engrafted word received by faith and the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ shining forth from our life into the world as the lights that God has born into his kingdom. So this is the idea, the father of lights. But in order to, I didn't want to lead you along to try to get there. I want you to have that in mind as we go through this sermon this morning. The idea that God is the father of lights and in him is no darkness at all. Now when we go to the creation and, and the, the longer I study the word of God and the longer uh, that I grow in grace and, and walk by faith in Christ Jesus, the more I'm persuaded that there is an entire universe of study just to be had in the creation as it re recorded for us in the book of Genesis. That contained in those chapters uh, that Moses wrote of the creation of God on this earth, that there are so much to be understood just from that account that you could study that for years on end and probably never grow weary of the new things that you discover. But we know from that, from that account that the Bible says that the earth was darkness. It was darkness. Now, if you study the creation account in Genesis, it's interesting, and I don't know how significant it is, but it's interesting that when you read through the account of creation, all the things that God made and all the things he did, he said were good with only two exceptions. One I'm not going to spend time to get into today, but it's interesting that on the first day of creation, that God beheld the earth and it was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And Bible says that the Spirit of God moved. And that Spirit, that breath of God, that word moved, has the idea of softness or compassion. Kind of like the fluttering feeling that you might get when you are with your special uh, person that you love deeply and that deep affection and love you feel for them. That's the idea of that word moved. So God looked on the earth, and it was darkness, and it was void, uh, and he was moved with compassion. And at that moment, he spoke these words, let there be light. Now the Bible tells us on that first day of creation that that light that God spoke into existence, and it was, that God saw it, and it was good. He then goes on to say that he divided the light from the darkness. But no place in the account of creation anywhere does God say that the darkness was good. He only shows us the picture of the earth as complete darkness and void of his work. And when he begins to work, he shows us that everything he does is good. But that darkness that was already there is never spoken of as being good. But the work of God and the intervention of God and the power of God moving on that void and empty creation began a work that was good. And it started with this, let there be light. And we know from the prophet Jeremiah and we know from the New Testament as well that those pictures from, and John talks about this, that that picture of the creative work of God sending his light into the darkness is exactly the same type of creative power of God that takes place when we are born again. Amen. The book of Jeremiah uses the exact same picture of creation, looking on the earth, and it was empty, and it was void. And he uses that same picture of the desolations of Jerusalem and all of the uh, things that God was going to bring to pass. And then he goes on from there, and we know that the work of restoration that God is going to do in the land of Israel, in the future days. So that work and that type of creation is exactly what the gospel of Jesus Christ does in our lives. Jesus Christ is that light that was spoken. Now it's interesting if you continue to go through the account of creation. We know that there was light on day one, and there was darkness on day one, and they were divided. And that there was the night, and there was the day, and that was the first day. We then go through several more days of creation, and on day three you get plants and all the, the vegetation and all those things. And then day four, 
God actually creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. Now, it's interesting that there was light present, and there was a day and night cycle, and there was all those things before the sun was ever made. There was actually even plant life before they had the sun. Now, scientists will tell us that it's the light of the sun that gives life to plants, but plants were alive before the sun was around, and they had life. Because all life is of God. So this light that he's created, which was already there, but it wasn't known in a form or by a name until the fourth day. Now, if you follow the account of creation, you'll know and recognize that that a day being as a thousand years unto the Lord, that on day four, Jesus Christ came in the flesh and was known as Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And just like on the fourth day, the Son was made and given power to rule the day. And all the stars and all those other things were made as well. And that is a type of God's work, not only in the realm of nature that we see, but also his creative work as it pertains to the spiritual things of Christ and the kingdom of God. I want you to consider this morning, as we kind of go forward with this idea of the Father of lights and the creative work of God in us, uh, that if, if you behold the timeline that is, God has laid out in his word of what's going to happen on the earth, there's some remarkable events going to transpire that take us from this time into the millennium when Christ is on the earth reigning for a thousand years and then the conclusion of that period which is absolutely uh, miraculous because the prophecy we already have that says that Satan's going to be released at the end, end of a thousand years to deceive the world the people living in the world at that time will be deceived even though we already have that prophecy today but yet after all the conclusion of those things We see that all those things being taken away and all the things pertaining to even the heavenly temple and the earthly temple and the conclusion of all those matters. We see a new heaven. We see a new earth. We see something brand new. And the Bible even says of the new Jerusalem that's in that new heaven and new earth that there is no temple, but that God himself will dwell among his people and he is the temple And so all the things we receive in patterns and types are building to that conclusion. I I want you to think about the fact that today, those who are born again by faith in Christ Jesus and have believed the gospel, been born anew, are already partakers of and living in what will be the new creation that God will make. Now there's nothing else other than God's word that is eternal. And it's that received word which James tells us. It is that word that we receive. That is the power. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the the instrument by which uh, the Lord has chosen the, the news of his redemption and the plan that he has for mankind be preached and received. That's astounding to think about the fact that those children of God that are already those children of light, that he's the father of lights and we are children of light. That's what the Bible says that he's preparing us even now to go into the kingdom of Christ and into the eternal state of glory in Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. So those things that he's preparing and doing in us, I say that to say this, that your life and mine, and this is the point that James is trying to make as he's walking the believers through this uh, analogy, that your life and mine today in this present time are to reflect the righteousness of God and the glory of God in that same way that will be represented in the fullness of times when all of those other things are complete. That we are living in Christ Jesus today, abounding in the knowledge of Him and in the glory of God. We're supposed to be abounding in all of those things today, just like as if we will be living in His kingdom in the future. That is why when we gather together as a church, those heavenly places in Christ that he's caused us to sit. Our our, uh, pastor emeritus preached a sermon on that not too many months ago. That's the idea, that he has sent into us his eternal pure word. Now, we know a lot of things about light, and it's still a mystery to this day. But this light that we're talking about is an example of a lot of things. There's power in it. There's life in it. It's pure. All of those things that he has given to us by his son Jesus Christ and by his spirit indwelling us, that those things are to be active and working in our life 
to purify us and to cause us to live unto him as the children of God. So let's read this again, because he says in verse 16, do not err. Now what he's talking about is that, that darkness. There was a lot of, uh, I will call it, sown confusion in the time of the early church, and Paul addresses it a lot, and it's still present with us today trying to discern the difference between the work of God and the work of sin. Because what was happening at the time was people were saying, well, God made me this way, right? God made me the way I am, and so I have certain needs and desires, and those are from God too, and it's all fine, and in Christ Jesus we're all fine. We just live and we'll be fine. James is is taking a different approach, and he's because already in verse 13 he's saying, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. Because he's saying that God, the way he works, he's not uh, able to be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man with evil. And then he goes right to the heart of the issue, because he doesn't even blame the devil like we do a lot today. He goes right to man. And he says, the evil that's present with us and among us is because it's working in us. And he contrasts that to the work of God in us, which is the light that he speaks of. So he's contrasting these two things in a way that says, don't be deceived. That's why he's he's building this uh, argument to this place, to not be deceived. Why? Because we should know and understand what the will of God is for us. Because it's been shown to us in Christ Jesus. So the gospel of Christ, through the life and the ministry of Christ, teaches us what Peter says, what manner of persons ought we to be. Because Christ has shown that to us by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So to err is to confuse what God's doing in us with those other desires that are already there but inherent by the nature of Adam. Through the sin that we have being born onto this earth, that God has sent his light, that that old nature is that darkness and that void into which the light has shined. And that creation work having been begun in us by the receiving of God's gospel of Jesus Christ by faith, is to continue until the completeness and the fullness of that creation, that creative work is done. That's going to happen for every child of God. It's going to happen. If the light of the Word of God has shown into your heart and you've received Jesus Christ by faith, then that that evidence proves the working of God the Father in, in that person's life, and that creative work having started is going to come to completeness and fullness when that person stands in the image of Christ, blameless and faultless before God the Father. James' point is that that creative work has already begun when we receive the word of the gospel. And so when we talk about the Father of lights, uh, that should be a term that we take very personally. He's the Father of lights, and I am one of those lights that he has fathered, that he has sent the light of the gospel And we're going to go through some scriptures to show you this. A lot of this goes back to, I think, understanding the promise of God to Abraham. And we're going to take a real quick look at this. Uh, And you don't have to turn there, although you can if you enjoy reading around the scriptures, because that's a good way to get context. But in Genesis chapter number 22 and verse 17, the Lord makes this promise to Abraham that was very well known uh, and very well published saying that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. This promise to Abraham, we know from the New Testament, that this seed that's spoken of, the singular seed, the seed of Abraham, according to the book of Hebrews, is Jesus Christ. That he is the promised seed, the Holy One of God, the Anointed One, that would be the fulfillment of all the promises of God to Abraham. Now notice what he says in this verse, that in blessing he will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed. So the seed that was promised was Christ. And Christ came and fulfilled that promise to Abraham, confirming the covenant that God had made to Abraham by promise in the life and death and atonement of Jesus Christ to make him a blessing to all nations and to multiply his seed. And this multiplication of seed as the stars of heaven. 
means what? Talking about those who by faith are joined together with Jesus Christ as one spirit and become heirs of the promise that was given to Abraham by faith in Christ Jesus. And that we being gathered together into Christ, into that same promise that we are the multiplication of the seed that was promised in Christ. Now there's a lot of different uh, ideas about this uh, stars in the sand. And, and I'll let you study some of those things out and, and do some of your own homework. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of prophecy wrapped up in what is being said. I think ultimately you can see uh, a, a fulfillment of that at the coming of Jesus Christ at his second coming. Whenever he comes with his saints, all those stars of heaven to the earth, and those on the earth who are deemed worthy by Christ to inherit the earth through Christ, inherit the earth in flesh and blood. And you will have at that time the, the seed of Abraham on the earth as the sand of the shore, and you will have the reigning saints of God as the stars of heaven. Just an idea. But there's a lot wrapped up in that. But none of that is possible without Jesus Christ. He is the promised seed. And he is the multiplication of that seed that produces this light that is the stars of heaven, as it were. So all these things promised to Abraham, fulfilled in Christ, and now continuing to be fulfilled in you and I. So if you turn over to John chapter number 1, this is a, and keep your, just keep your finger there in the book of James, because we'll be right back over there shortly. And these are well-known passages of scripture, but I thought it good to look them up and rehearse them to ourselves nonetheless. In John chapter number one, in verse number one, it says, in the beginning was the word. Now, of course, he goes on to say, that Jesus Christ is that living word, the word made flesh, which we also see in the book of Revelation that was given to John, that we see the one coming on the white horse whose name is the word of God. And this uh, word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now remember, the, the purpose of light, as it was given at creation, was for several things. And we're going to touch on some of this a little bit more tonight. Uh, but the purpose of the light given was to shine light and to, to reveal and to make known. And it, it chases away the darkness, right? It doesn't, it doesn't just... Uh, influence the darkness. The darkness has no power. Everywhere the light shines, the darkness flees. There's no power in darkness other than that there's absence of light. But the light that shined didn't destroy darkness at that time. It was given to separate the light from the darkness. Because there's a time coming. There's a harvest coming on the earth that is foretold in Scripture. There's a day of reckoning that's coming on the earth. And this work of separation is the work of God, to separate the light from the darkness. And that work is not only true as it relates to the children of the devil that he's sown into the earth and the children of God that he has made in the earth, but it also has to do with in your life and mine. Particularly, we see that there is truth to be applied from the New Testament that your life and mine at this time as a type of the earth, this Adam, this flesh and blood body that we inhabit, at this time has both wheat and tares, does it not? If you've received the word of God, then that wheat, that crop has taken root and is growing. But there's also things in our flesh that we know are worthy and necessarily must be consumed and destroyed, which the power of light does and will do. Our God is a consuming fire. All these things about light are true of God, and his design and intent in creation is to make he said, let us make man in our image. So when he gets to that point of creation, he begins to talk about making man in our image. And that purpose of God has never been thwarted by the acts of Satan or by the acts of wicked men. God is still in the process of making men into his image. Amen. 
And that initial purpose he stated will be accomplished. And it will be accomplished in those who believe in Jesus Christ. Because the Spirit of God, by the power of God, will accomplish it. We will be made. I know this is hard to believe today. As I stand here and preach this to you today, we're living in a wicked world. We're, we ourselves, are, this creature that we inhabit itself, is encompassed with the infirmity of sin. It's hard for us to imagine today that we could ever be what the Bible says that we will be in Christ. But by faith, we know it to be so. That the power of God will prevail to make men in our image and in our likeness. And that is what is going to happen. And this is playing out over time. And it's all made possible by that beginning one, Jesus Christ. The one by whom all the worlds were created. And so we see that work of God, the creative work of God, being done in his children to make them like unto him. Who is light? And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And you go down to verse number uh, 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. We've talked about that verse before. But as many as received him, to them gave he, what? Power to become the, what? Sons of God. Now, if God is light, and we've been given power to be his sons, then we are the children of light which is what the New Testament shares in a couple other places. So those who have believed, he gave this power, even to them that believe on his name. So we see that the creative work of God, the power of God, is not to all men, but to those who have believed. The power of God is to those who have believed. That's who the power of God, this creative work, to be made into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, is working in those who have believed. That in them should shine forth their righteousness. The Bible says that our righteousness will break forth as the sun. Who is our righteousness? It's Jesus Christ. And it's that new man that we're told to put on, that image of Christ that we are to put on, that in the fullness of time, when we are redeemed from the earth, that 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 righteousness of Christ, that new creation that he has made within us, will break forth, death will be swallowed up of life, we will come forth as more than conquerors, overcoming by our faith in the one who is able to save. That's our hope. That's the plan of God, that we should be these children. So when the Bible says that God is a father of lights, he is in so many more ways than one. He did it in creation to typify as an example his work, but that work is continuing. And it's continuing in you and I that we should be lights. You look at the purpose of God in creating the sun and the moon and the stars. And I don't want to get into that too much this morning. I'd rather uh, do some of that tonight because there's some interesting thoughts there because we're all looking for things of the end times, right? And there's so much uh, about the signs of the heavens and all those things. We're going to just touch on that, hopefully just enough to whet your appetite so you'll go home and study. But there is a lot to be said for what God is doing in that type we have in creation and that continued work of God that we know is his will for the life of the believer until it shines what? More and more unto that perfect day. So that perfect day in which that new man that we have of Jesus Christ comes to the fullness and it is actually revealed, right? We talk talk about the revelation of the sons of God. When that time comes that the sons of God will be revealed, the true character and nature of our person as it is in Christ, not as we know it today where we have also this old nature of the flesh that we are constrained in, this creature that Paul says doth groan, that, that creature that we have right now that does groan by reason of the curse and sin and the things of this world that we have to live in today, having our hope in God, our confidence in God, our faith in God. So this word of truth is the word by which we are born. We see that in uh, 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So it's that word of God received by faith. Remember, it has to be received into the heart by faith. It's not a head knowledge. First of all, it's not of the will of man, it's not of the will of flesh. It's a creative work of God. 
That salvation process, if you want to call it a process, the work of God that is redemption is not of the will of man, but it's that being mixed with faith. Where does faith come from? It comes from God as well. So let that soul that has not ask of him that is able to give in faith, trusting that he will receive. That is the, the hope we have of salvation, that the word of God has come and those not mixed with faith, they wrestle it to their own destruction. But when it comes to those and it's mixed with faith and they believe the testimony of God concerning them, the testimony of God concerning them and the testimony of God concerning his own son, Jesus Christ. Which is the testimony, you know, I've, I've mentioned this a number of times, and I hate to chase a rabbit or two, but I feel like I've stayed pretty well on point this morning so far. So, first one. The law of God that was given, the Bible says that the man that doeth them shall live in them. That can only speak of one man. There's only one man who ever did them and lived in them, and that was Jesus Christ. And Jesus taught his disciples that all the things that were written in the law concerned him. So you must believe the testimony of the most righteous one, and you have to believe the testimony of yourself and your own condemnation because of sin. And when that is received by faith, the light of God's truth has shined in. Why? Because you're now confessing. It's not doing. You can't do righteousness. It's the gift of God. But when your mouth begins to confess what your heart has believed, that the testimony of God is true, that he is righteous, and I am wicked and worthy of condemnation and judgment, now you're confessing the truth, which is contrary to your nature. The nature of man doesn't want to confess to the truth. It's deceived. But now having received the word of God, which is the truth, being persuaded by the Spirit of God by faith that it is true, now the mouth of your, of your body begins to confess to the truth that your heart has received, which is in the word of God. And now you're actually living by faith contrary to your own nature because your own nature does not want to make such a confession. The blessing of Abraham is to all those who believe by faith. In John 8, 12, it says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. That inexplicable light that shone on day one, that didn't have a name, didn't have a, a form, was not known by any proper creation or form until day four. And then it was revealed as the sun and given a name. But that light that shines, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He made a lot of such claims. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the bread from heaven. I am the everlasting spring of water. I am. He's all those things. All of the creation looks to him. He is the God of the earth, the Bible says. And he has been sent in these last days to testify to us of the work of his Father. So Jesus Christ says, I'm the light of the world. And he says all, he was sent by his Father. The relationship with his Father he spoke of often and all the time about how they were one, and yet he was sent by the Father. He spoke always the things that pleased the Father. He did always the things that pleased the Father. He said, I am this light, and he is the Word of God. He's, and he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. So we see then that there is an agreement in all of these things in the person of Jesus Christ that God has sent him to be the first among his uh, creatures. We're told he's the first fruits. You know, it's interesting if you study the account of creation as well. The first, we read, in the beginning, God created. But in the Hebrew, there's actually only three words. And then there's a fourth word that's not translated, that's uh, silent and says just to, I guess, pause or something in the reading. But that word, in the beginning, is actually one word in the Hebrew. And I don't remember what it is right offhand, and I don't speak Hebrew anyway, so it doesn't matter. But that one word basically means the chiefest, the first fruits, the, the, the highest, and all this. So we say in the beginning. Christ was the beginning. He's the beginning of all things. And it's through him that God created all these things in this life. So that light of God that's shown in creation, which, by which we continue to see today... And it puzzles scientists, too. I don't know. I don't really trust scientists at all in anything, let alone their measurements. But they tell us that scientists have measured the light of the universe 
which to me just sounds preposterous anyway. But nonetheless, they have measured the light of the universe, and mathematically, there's 400% more light in the universe than should be there just by virtue of the stars and quasars and things that actually emit light, and they don't know where it comes from. So, I mean, we don't very good at measuring things anyway. So I don't trust the measurement process, but nonetheless, it stands the light of all creation, whether it's Jesus Christ who, by whom the sun was made for us, but he is the light. In any sense and every sense, what Paul says, both seen and unseen, all those things were made by him. And so that's uh, important for us to understand. And for what purpose? Go back to the book of James, and we'll begin to close uh, as we look at the purpose of God in this. Because this is, uh, as it pertains to you and I, very important. We see that the work of God in the book of James is given uh, as it contrasts the natural state of man, which is what? The natural man only tends to decay. So we come forth from the womb speaking lies, and spiritually and naturally, everything natu of the natural man tends to decay. Right? They're headed to the grave both physically and spiritually. And so progressively and always they hasten to that end, barring the intervention of the light of God, who the power of life and creation to restore and amend and to send them the opposite way, which is the, the direction of the spiritual man, which is being born again by the power of God and tending always to be more and more lively, more and more like Christ more and more spiritual, abounding more and more in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we see the natural man tends to death, but the spiritual man tends to life through Christ Jesus. And his direction is always an upwards calling and an onward calling. And these things are set at opposites in the book of James. And so he says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. In other words, it is the work of God. Apart from the work of God, the natural man will only go to death and go to the grave. It is the work of God to intervene and to work redemption, salvation, restoration, forgiveness, purity, righteousness, holiness. All the things he says we must be to see him, it's his work to do it in us. It's his creative power by the gospel and through faith in Christ Jesus. So all those things working in us tend that way to understand the work of God in us. All these gifts come down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In other words, in creation, what do we see? That even the sun at different times of year, it exerts a different amount uh, of heat or influence on the things of the earth. The, the moon, it turns and changes and shines. So these natural forces may vary and change from time to time from our perspective. But God is not that way. That God is constant. He's not varying. He's unchangeable. And so we see that he's not as those natural forces that we understand, but having created all those things for our benefit, with him there is no variableness. There is no shadow of turning. He, there is no darkness. He is light. He is light personified. All the power, all the purity, everything that you can imagine is light. In the, in the holy place, in the tabernacle, uh, when, they, when they had the altar of incense and the table of showbread and the what? The golden candlestick. And it was lit. And why? Because those lights represented the presence of the glory of God. And we know and understand from Hebrew uh, tradition as well as biblical accounts that the presence of God shone from between the cherubims above the mercy seat, which they called the Shekinah, the glory of God. What was it? It appeared as a light. So in all these things, it is a type to show us the power, the purity, the righteousness, and the work of God in us. Why is that important? Because we get to verse number 18, and he tells us of his own will. Right? So God had a desire. He had a purpose. God has a will. You know, all the time on the earth, we're concerned with man's will. Right? We're, we talk about man's will. We live kind of day to day in that place. But God has a will. He's making decisions. Did you know that? God is reigning on his throne. He's making decisions about nations. He's making decisions about the earth. He's making decisions about natural events. He's making decisions about individuals on a daily moment by moment basis. 
He's making decisions, and according to his will, begat he us by the word of truth. Now, we were not begotten as Jesus Christ was begotten. We are adopted sons because we have and possess the nature of Adam, but he sent by his spirit the, work, the word of Christ, according to the gospel, into our hearts by faith. So we are, in that sense, the sons of God. And how is it that we are the sons of God? It is that he begot us by this word of truth, the word of truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of God received by faith, having come in and that we receive it, that we should be a kind of first fruits, a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So what God is doing to take it, take a big long view, because sometimes it's hard to see this in the day-to-day, but, but James makes this comparison in order to teach us how we ought to live as the children of God in the day-to-day. But what he's saying is, and we'll, we'll close with this, uh, and then we'll pick up tonight and go a little further, but what he's saying here is that those first fruits, those who are the multiplication of this seed that was promised to Abraham, that have received the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith, becoming the children of light, uh, which we haven't gotten to, that far yet for you to see that in scripture, but I think you're beginning to correlate the idea uh, that the, this is the first fruits of his creatures. So God is creating. What is a creature? It's something God made. So when the Bible says that we are any man that is in him is a new creature, that's what it's saying. We are a new creation, something brand new. As those who have been partakers of the divine nature, having received the word of truth, and not having seen yet the fullness of that redemption, or having, uh, but as it were, as Romans says in chapter 8, I think, as, as it were, having received it by hope and by faith. What, see, what is seen is not yet hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But we are saved by hope. God has given us a hope. And it's so hard for us as carnal creatures on this earth today, living where we live, among whom we dwell, to realize the fullness and the power of the gospel and the plans that God has for you and for I forever, for those who are in Christ Jesus, that we should be a first fruits, first fruits. Those who are already created and reborn into the kingdom of God that hasn't yet appeared to mankind, but we're already reborn and living as citizens of that kingdom that is to come. And our prayer is with the Lord Jesus, thy kingdom come. And even beyond the kingdom into the new creation, we see a new heaven and we see a new earth and we see a new Jerusalem, all prophesied and foretold, which there is good is done. I mean, you have to grasp that by faith. It is a done deal, though it be a far ways off to us. That new Jerusalem, new earth, new heaven, who's going to populate that? These new creatures. These new creatures, there's nothing there except those who dwell in righteousness. So the, the, the responsibility of us is what James begins to go on to say, because he uses the word wherefore at the beginning of verse number 19, saying wherefore. In other words, since these things are true, since we know them to be true, then he goes on to say how we should be living. And you can go through the book and he talks about uh, a lot about the tongue, how we use our tongue, and what should be happening with this tabernacle that we live in and dwell in because it is the possession of God Almighty. It is his temple, and we're not to defile it. We're supposed to treat it as such. But more importantly, we ought to live as those who are reborn into the kingdom of righteousness of Jesus Christ, even though in the earth today we don't see it yet. Because that is the faith that we have. And like our Father, who's the Father of lights, who speaks of things that are not as though they were, we're called to live as things that we do not see yet, but we know they are. And so we're called to live that way. And so all the things about loving one another, loving God, loving your brother, and all the things that we're admonished to do in Christ Jesus, to not slander one another, not be backbiting, Uh, And we see this lived out in the lives of Stephen as he was praying for those that were stoning him. Even as he was being stoned, we see the, the love and the compassion they had because they were already 
reborn citizens of that new kingdom, even though they hadn't seen it yet, and it wasn't realized yet, the light of the truth of God's word was dwelling in them richly in all wisdom, the Bible says. And that's how we are to be walking as well as children of God, children of light. He is the father of lights. He sent forth his light, and he's doing a creative work to bring forth that which he has promised will come forth. Amen? Amen. It's good. The Father of Lights. It's a good, uh, good study and a good admonition. As I said, the, the work of God in us is always for the one who is alive in Christ Jesus and has been quickened by his spirit and made alive, always tending towards life, the things of Christ, growing and increasing more and more, abounding more and more. Until that perfect day. Amen. We'll have a verse of invitation. Brother Josh and Ms. Wyola, if you'll come. Father's Day. Give honor to the Father. Amen. Amen. Every good and perfect gift is from Him. 602. Hymn number 602. It's all stands. <clears throat>